Hi, everybody. Let me just get out of this. Um, hi, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, my name's Susan Gallo and I'm with Maine Lakes and we're hosting um, Jim Peruk, our author talk tonight. So uh, really glad you all could make it. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, hopefully you learned a little bit about Maine Lakes through our slideshow that was rotating through as you joined, but um, we're a statewide conservation organization based in uh, Yarmouth, Maine, and we work on all kinds of things, including um, advocacy, education, and um, we have lots of great publications. We work with lake associations. We are in touch with legislators and other decision makers to support Sound Lake policy. Um, and so if you're not familiar with us, uh, go to lakes.me and find out more. We'd love to have, it, have you as a member. Uh, so this, the format for today is, um, we do a lot of webinars here. We actually don't have our webinar functionality at the moment. So this is running like a meeting. So it's a little bit different. Um, everybody's muted, but you can use the chat, uh, use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you can't see it, you can click the little three dots um, and you get more and then you should see uh, a chat function. So uh, if you have questions for Jim, he will, will, will sort of organize the, questions from the chat and get them to Jim at the end of his talk. Um, you can have your video on if you want, but while Jim's talking, it's probably a good idea to turn it off because um, having been a speaker, it's distracting to, to, have, um, to see other people when you're talking. So um, turning off videos while Jim talks would be great. Um, and then um, when he's done, we can, um, you can join with the video if you want. Um, but like I said, enter your questions in the chat and then, um, without further ado, I will do a quick, very quick introduction. Uh, hopefully you read Jim's, um, bio when it popped up in the, um, slideshow, but we're really lucky to have Jim in the state of Maine. He is a professor at, um, St. Joseph's College in Standish. He's worked before that, he worked for BRI, and I feel really lucky to have known him for many years. He's um, a really knowledgeable speaker, knows a lot about loons, and is here today to share his new book with, um, with us. And just, I'll do a quick preface to say, and Jim obviously is gonna tell us a lot more about it. The book is really, uh, focuses on, kind of the evolution of loons and the evolutionary, you know, why are loons what they are today and what has shaped what has shaped them. And so he's not gonna talk a lot about numbers or conservation measures. He's really gonna focus, I, I think this will be a great, a little bit of a different topic for a lot of our loon enthusiasts who are here. This is information you probably haven't heard before, a lot of it, and it's a little bit of a deep, deeper dive into the more science, um, end of things. Uh, so I think for people who've seen a lot of loon talks before, I think this one's going to be different. I'm really excited. I told Jim earlier today his book's on my Christmas list, so we'll see um, if Santa delivers. I'm looking forward to that, on, hopefully on Christmas Day, curling up with this book. Um, so without further ado, Jim, I'll pass it on to you. Uh, you're mute. You're muted. And it, like I said, if ever, if others could turn off their video while Jim talks, that would be fantastic. And we, I will see you at the end of the talk. Uh, you're still muted, Jim. Hold on. There I you think go. that will work. We are good. Hello, everybody. All right. And thanks for making the effort. To be here this evening, I look forward to talking about loons. I feel quite fortunate to be able to talk about loons and to have the opportunity to study this bird for the past 30 years. So this talk will go somewhere between 35 and 45 minutes, depending how sidetracked I get with some things. But I'm going to try to keep it on the shorter side. And then we can have some Q&A afterwards as we kind of work through this. 
uh, maybe questions about the book and kind of the background towards it. So I'm going to kind of talk about some personal stories, some narratives I've had with loons. Also, I'm going to try to tell you the loon story from the lens of a biologist and how I approach wildlife. And then I'm going to kind of give you some highlights of what we've learned about loons over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. So I'll kind of get right into it. So real briefly, my story, I have to mention Dave Evers. <clears throat> Dave's the executive director at Biodiversity Research Institute in Portland, Maine. Dave and I met, <clears throat> excuse me, in college. And for his master's degree, he was trying to figure out how to catch loons. And so this is us in the very early stages of trying to figure out going out at night, spotlighting, and trying to catch these birds and put bands on them. And it was quite an interesting process doing this for several years. So I thank Dave for kind of getting me involved in the very beginning with loons. So once you have a loon in the net, what, what allowed us to be successful and what Dave figured out was that if you go out at night and loons have chicks, the parental instinct is so strong that the adults are not gonna leave those chicks. So you can literally just motor in your boat idling and just scoop them up out of the water as we see here. <clears throat> Excuse me, so once you have a loon in the hand, you might as well gather as much data as you can. So as a scientist, it's an opportunity to gather as much data at one time. So you wanna take the weight of the bird, you might take bill measurements, you might spread its wings out as we see here and take wing measurements. Uh, for example, there's blood samples, feather samples you could take. So in this case, to try to monitor toxins, for example. Then you can kind of put bands on. And the one thing you notice about the loon leg is that it's, it's compressed, it's flattened. So th those are specially made bands. And those bands become real important for us. So when you look at a loon and all of us have, there's usually some moment of pause and hesitation to determine which one's male and which one's female. Well, banding allowed us to kind of break through those barriers and feel confident about male and females, what their roles are. And banding really opened the door for lots of information that we could learn about loons. So literally in the last 30 years, because of lots of banding efforts, and to give you a heads up, there's over 5,000 loons that are banded in North America. We can follow these individuals over time. So we can tell males from females, and by tracking individuals over time, we can ask questions, you know, do they pair for life, for example? Do they switch territories? Do they switch lakes? Do chicks come back to the natal area? How long do they live? Lots of useful information for someone interested in studying loons. So my PhD research started back in 1993. I put little white test testers model airplane paint on the base of the bill. This allowed me at a distance to know whether it was the male or female, because sometimes those bands were underwater and I couldn't always tell. And this is me working in the Gulf of Mexico just a few years ago. So I've been fortunate to study loons on their breeding grounds, their non-breeding grounds during migration at stopover spots and wintering locations. And just to give people a little background and perspective on my uh, research I've done, each of these highlights in yellow is a place where I've worked in North America and the number of field seasons that I conducted research in those areas. And those field seasons might be two weeks long at a minimum, or they might be four, five, or six months long. And depending on the staff and the research question that was being asked, the funding uh, determined how long these projects went. So you'll see that I spent some time in Saskatchewan, Alaska, Washington, Nevada, Southern California, Louisiana, South Carolina. So that's an interior reservoir located there off New England. And then in the Midwest where I, where I grew up and where I really got to learn loons. So the loon stories, as we're kind of going on parallel with stories that I've experienced, they really have a specialized niche. They're diver, they're divers and very few birds are divers. So many ducks are on the surface, they're puddle ducks, but to really pursue underwater prey and be successful requires some unique anatomical modifications. 
So it would be ideal if we can just look up loonancestry.com and find the ancestors of loons, but that's not really readily available to us. So we mostly look at fossils and DNA to try to tell the story of the loon. So present day loons, there's five species, the common loon being the one that we're most familiar with. Literally the paleontological data suggests we're literally in the last 2.6 million years. And then if you go back a little bit, the first time we see fossils of the genus Gavia, which the loons belong to, somewhere between five and 20 million years ago. And if we go further back, probably the ancestor of loons is a genus called Columboides. That takes us to like 20 to 40 million years ago. So what did Columboides look like? Well, they've kind of were able to piece the fossils together. And you can see it's smaller than the modern day loon. Its feet are not as far back. And so you can see that there's been some modifications of the skeletal system from here to today's modern day. Now, what would be of interest is, of course, what was the ancestor that predated Columboides? Well, they found literally about 12 marine birds that were adept at diving underwater. Uh, loons could be descendant of one of these birds, but, but probably not. But I have these here just to give you an idea that swimming in the Cretaceous seas, you know, 70 to 80 million years ago, were warm-blooded birds diving and were quite adept and successful at this niche. So this niche has been uh, going on for, you know, since the, ever since the Cretaceous. Now you might wonder where some of these fossils are found. And I talk about this in the book that some of these fossils were found in Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. And for some of us that might be incredulous, like we found fossils there. Well, this map I showed you here is the Western Interior Seaway. This is what the Cretaceous looked like 60 to 80 million years ago. There's a large, literally ocean that divided North America into two, two land masses. And loons are descendant of these birds that were originally marine birds. And eventually the land pinched off and I think loons became landlocked and became freshwater. They started adapting to freshwater, of course, when this land mass kind of changed its shape. So that's kind of the story of the loon ancestry. And then another common question I get are loons nearest ancestors. So like, what have we learned? There's been a lot of research and data on this. And this is the most recent up-to-date kind of finding. So through DNA sequencing, and other molecules in the DNA in the genome. Uh, taxonomists have concluded that penguins were the nearest ancestor to loons at roughly 50 to 55 million years ago. So loons and penguins shared a common ancestor going back that far and then they've, they've gone on different trajectories ever since. So that's our loon ancestry. So now time for a little story. January 2012, I was working off the coast of Louisiana investigating the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and the effects that may have had on loon health. So you can see loons in the bottom corner there and cormorants up top. And just to be down in that area when my family was up in Maine freezing, I got a chance to see pelicans and skimmers and roseate spoonbills and spending time out in the Gulf was just a wonderful experience for me, one that I, I treasure and deeply appreciated. I saw some fascinating loon behavior. Oftentimes they were feeding on crabs in the winter. Occasionally a crab would pinch a loon. Uh, it did not take kindly to that behavior and would subsequently retrieve it and basically declaw it right before swallowing it. But one of the highlights for me, literally every day when I went out studying loons in the winter, I would see bottlenose dolphins. So there was a pod there and just to see a marine cetacean, such as a bottlenose dolphin, with a mega charismatic species like a loon, which just literally made my day and was real exciting. And I got a chance to see these two species interact. And I write about it in the book. And um, I have a little section in here about it. And I, I won't read it because it, it's, it's a little long. And if you kind of purchase the book, you can kind of go through the story. But Literally what I'm gonna tell you in a nutshell is what I observed was that this dolphin was fluking towards shore and literally hurting small fish. And small fish were then moving to the peripheral to get away from the dolphin. And the loon was swimming in the wake, right, of the dolphin. 
picking up fish that were trying to avoid the dolphin. And just to see that it was mind, mind boggling as a behaviorist to see that loons were taking advantage of what the dolphin was feeding uh, and used it successfully, showing us that loons are extraordinarily adaptable. So the one thing about studying loons in the winter is there's still a lot to learn. On the breeding grounds, we're there 24 seven. We see loons, they're in the backyard. There's so many eyes on them that we're gonna catch all these unusual behaviors. But in the winter time, there's still lots to learn and that's why I'm excited about spending as much time in the winter learning about loons. So now back to our loon story. So once loons gave up being aerialist, right, they adapted to being in the water. Their whole life was to become highly specialized. So their goal was to be streamlined, maximize efficiency, minimize drag. They're trying to be better at, at catching fish, for example, than fish are at evading being captured. And so there's different selection pressures on loons that once they kind of made this transition back to water, yeah, and to be successful. So I'm gonna talk about traits that loons underwent anatomically that more likely increased their survival or potentially their hunting success, for example. And in the book, I, I talk about this. I also talk about physiological traits and behavioral traits. But for this one, I'm mostly gonna just talk about anatomical traits. And to kind of give us perspective, we're looking at aerodynamic efficiency. So whether you're moving through the air or water, kind of similar media, you're trying to be streamlined. And if we're looking at aerodynamic efficiency, most of us looking at this saying just based on shape alone, for example, in terms of looking at how air flows around the Prius, you, it's going to flow much more smoothly. So it's something we call laminar flow versus turbulent flow. So if you catch any rough edges, for example, air or water is going to circulate around there and create drag and make you less efficient. So as a loon, you're trying to be like a Prius, you're trying to be extreme, extraordinarily streamlined to minimize drag. So I'm gonna show you kind of an interesting picture here of a swimmer. And we notice that it has a suit on. So here's a champion swimmer wearing these suits. And what was the controversy around these suits probably about eight, nine years ago? Well, the, the controversy was this act is like a second skin and it minimized drag so much so that they were, they were breaking swimming records and they were banned from uh, international competition in 2012. Well, the reason they were banned, right, is because they were highly successful at reducing drag. So making the body streamlined, torpedo shaped, eliminating any drag, for example. So when we look at a loon, that's kind of what the loon model is kind of uh, depicted in terms of the swimsuit. So it's very, very sleek, for example. There's no crest on their heads. The feathers are laid perfectly and the wings are very narrow. So they're oppressed close to the body. So if you're looking at this particular bird, if the wing was any wider, you know, the wing might stick out over the belly and create turbulent flow, which would reduce efficiency. And here we can see a loon sticking out its neck trying to catch a fish. So we've seen some modifications in the skeletal system. And one that I'll share with you is in terms of where the vertebral column or the spinal cord comes into the skull. On most birds, it comes in at about a 90 degree angle. But in loons, the, the uh, foramen magnum has the hole where the spinal cord enters has shifted ventrally. And so literally there's like zero degrees between where the spinal column enters and the skull base. That's gonna reduce drag. That's gonna make loons highly efficient. And that's essentially what we see, for example, compared to a bird such as a raptor, where it's coming at more of 90 degrees. Another unique modification in the skeletal system is that the upper jaw in most birds is fused to the skull case. And so birds feed by dropping the lower jaw. A loon can open that lower bill as well as the upper bill. So they have something we call cranial kinesis, where it's literally an unhinged, more similar to a snake, for example. That's going to allow it to open its mouth exceedingly wide. And more than likely, that serves as an adaptation to catch fish and to be highly successful, as we see here in this photograph. 
So let's look at some other anatomical modifications. When I held the loon in my head, in my hands, I was impressed by just how heavy the head was, for example. And having a heavy head is gonna help a loon sink faster when it's diving 50 feet, for example. It's just carrying a weight. It's gonna get you down to the bottom where the fish are. So you're gonna sink easier. You have dense bones versus hollow bones. So you're gonna have increased mass. That allow, again, is gonna allow you to sink faster and minimize your time and your effort getting down to the bottom of the lake, for example. And then to minimize drag, loons have exceedingly narrow shoulder girdles and hip girdles. And all that's gonna, again, gonna minimize drag and resistance. The lower leg is lengthened. That's gonna allow a loon to increase its stride and it's also flattened, for example. So this is gonna give it a big paddle in which to move. And so speaking of paddles, here's the canoe paddle. And I have this as a comparison because when the loon is swimming, it's trying to maximize its surface area. So it's gonna rotate its leg, its big feet, and use it more like a canoe paddle. And then on a recovery stroke, it'll rotate its leg and close its web, as such as that we see here. So in this photograph of these loons, I want you to appreciate just kind of how flattened those legs are. And then they can use that broad surface and the, and the webbing between their toes to increase their surface area to move them through the water quite rapidly. So now there's a trade-off with having the feet so far posterior, as most of us are aware, right? They can't support their center of their weight. Their center of gravity is shifted to the rear. And so basically the loon has to lunge when it's moving on land. And, hen and hence that's kind of where the name comes from, Scandinavian loom meaning clumsy. And I have to show you just the large webbed feet on a loon. It really helps for maximal propulsion. So now you're looking at the breastplate of a loon. So you got a top side view looking at it of the breastplate, but I'm more interested in, in the lateral view. So the bottom pictogram there. And if you look at that line drawing, you can see there's a keel that's very narrow. The keel on most birds for like a pigeon or a chicken, for example, is quite large. It's excessive literally. And that's because that's where the, the big chest muscles are attached to that keel. So if a bird needs to get off the ground air quickly, it's able to do that. Well, if a loon had a keel as large as a chicken or a pigeon, you can imagine that's gonna create turbulent flow, right? That's gonna increase drag, lower efficiency. So it's actually gonna be kind of maladaptive. So loons have extraordinary narrow sternums. Consequently, they have really few places to attach their chest muscles. So they do the best they can, but because loons spend literally 99% of their time underwater, this is a compromise that's worth easily to make. And as what you and I both know, the trade-off is a loon needs a long runway in order to get enough power and speed to, get, to attain lift. So my next story is gonna take us 1998 to Walker Lake, Nevada. This is the Great Basin Desert. You know, you know, who would think loons were there? I was teaching at a college out in California at this time. And I, would, I got asked to get involved in a project, a migration project of common loons. And this, this valley, I should mention to you, this lake's roughly 40 miles long, seven to 10 miles wide. It's through this valley. And winds can just howl through this, this valley across this lake. And that's gonna become an important part of the story. So Walker Lake's about an hour and a half south of Reno and several hours north of Vegas, just to kind of give you perspective. So biologists in the 1990s started counting loons during spring and fall on the lake. And they were reaching numbers of 1,200, 1,300 individuals, real impressive stopover spots. So loons were feeding there on fish. And what were they feeding on? Well, there were a couple of native fish in Walker Lake, Tui Chub and Lahontan Cutthroat Trout. So loons were feeding on the fish and we were called in to try to catch common loons. And so I will tell you just real briefly uh, a little bit from the story. I am going to read just a tiny bit for, for, from this 
just to kind of give you an example. So wildlife research involves roving parts and sometimes things do not always go according to plan. So here's a good example. So in 1998, Dave Evers and I were at Walker Lake teaming up with researchers, Mike Yates and Mark Fuller from Boise State University, Larry Neal from the Nevada Department of Wildlife and Kevin Kenow from the US Geological Survey in Wisconsin. Each team was there to do a specific job. Mike and Mark from Boise were leaders of the project. The team from Nevada had the boats, the drivers, and the expertise to navigate us around the lake. And Kevin was there and responsible for conducting surgeries and implanting the satellite transmitters. So that's kind of the story. So here's where things got a little complex. So first of all, we never caught loons during migration. We knew we were gonna have success on the breeding grounds, but during migration, there's no chicks there to keep the loons on the surface. So what's to prevent them from diving? So we made sure we had really long handled nets so we can stretch far out over the boats. The boats were much larger than what we used, for example, you know, in the early days in Michigan and Wisconsin. And before we went out, we got some news that the Nevada Department of Wildlife was monitoring the weather. And it looked like the next several days was gonna be high winds, 40 to 50 mile per hour, making the lake possibly unnavigable. So if we were gonna go, it was gonna be that night, which was fine, except the satellite transmitters, which they had tried to order and get everything together, were delayed and they, and they weren't there when we were going out that night. So we were sure they were gonna be there the very next day. And we just felt, well, let's just make the best of it and try to catch loons to see even if we would be successful. So we go out and we were successful. We caught five individual birds, which was real exciting. And then we had a decision to make, of course, was like, what do we do at this point, for example? And so we thought about it long and hard and loons are big hardy birds. And with our collective experience, we felt the loons would be fine if we kept them overnight, but where? With limited options, we reasoned to take them with us to our hotel rooms. Was this going to work? Like, like seriously. Then we tell the hotel manager we would each have an additional guest in our room. So sometimes wildlife research, these things just happen. So each of us kept alone in our own rooms, for example. We got through the night, everything for the most part went fine. The satellite transmitters came later than we hoped, they arrived at 12. And then we kind of conducted the surgeries. And it was really extraordinary to have a loon under anesthesia, right? For me, seeing that was really interesting and the loon coming out of anesthesia. And for those of us who have been under anesthesia, we remember what it's like to wake up out of that. Well, the loon looked just like that, right? Just like completely out of it. And you're like, oh my gosh. But within a couple of minutes, the loon was fine and active and everything was great. So then we put satellite transmitters in we released them and we were able to track them and the birds flew all the way to Saskatchewan, which was really fascinating. Now, what I wanna share with you is some of my final thoughts that none of us like the idea of holding the loons for more than 10 hours, but given the information we had, we decided it was best to hang on to them for the night rather than release them. That decision turned out to be the right one because the other nights during our stay were so windy, we never did get back on the water. And that's kind of what we feared. And that's kind of why we held on to these birds as long as we did. But for the most part, the loons came through fine. And it's kind of an interesting story. So the story could end there, but there's a catch to the story in a most remarkable way. So fast forward 12 years, and here we are in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Louisiana, catching loons. We would end up catching 128 loons over seven years. This was a crew uh, working with us. And we caught two loons in random in Louisiana. We put satellite transmitters in them in March of 2011, and we monitored them. Well, what did we find? Let's take a look. So one bird left, departed for 10 days, where it remained in Tennessee on a reservoir, went to Lake Michigan where it stayed for 15 days, six days in Lake Winnipeg. Uh, it eventually arrived in Northeast Saskatchewan, 52 day migration, 2,309 miles. 
Okay, what about the second bird? Well, the second bird, interesting enough, stayed off Mississippi, went to a reservoir in North Carolina, spends nine days in Chesapeake Bay, eventually gets to Lake Erie for 12 days, Lake Huron for 10 days. So we see a pattern, a loom to migrate four to five, 600 miles, and then it would stay for about a week or 10 days fattening up, for example. This bird also went to Lake Winnipeg and it ended up in Northwest Saskatchewan, 2,776 miles, the longest migration distance of any loon ever recorded. And your mind, I think, is turning over as mine did looking at this. It's unfathomable that these birds went to Saskatchewan. I was suspecting these birds came from the upper Midwest, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. The fact that they came from Saskatchewan, I could have guessed maybe Ontario or Quebec even, but Saskatchewan, and not only Saskatchewan, like Northwest Saskatchewan. So Darwin and I, we were kind of plotting these data and we started thinking Walker Lake, Nevada, what happened there? And looking at this map, you can see the dots kind of connect with the solid line up in Northwest Saskatchewan. So we zoomed in a little more and we come to a water body called Peter Pond Lake. Now make no mistake, Peter Pond Lake is a huge water body. Looks pretty small on a map, but pretty impressive. And that dark line is the bird from Louisiana, right? And the thin line is the birds from Walker Lake. And if we zoom in a little closer, we can see that these birds both use the exact same lake, the same corner of the lake, except 12 years apart. And as a wildlife biologist, you have some of these few eureka moments, uh, very few. Uh, just shocking results. And the fact that these two flyways came together in Saskatchewan was something I couldn't have dreamed. Uh, and it's something that I talk about in the book briefly. So I'm going to kind of go and give you like my top 10 research findings, just knowing that I spent quite a bit of time talking about physiology and lots of behavioral aspects and loons. But I thought for this group, what would be interesting, I try to bring everybody up to date on current loon research, what other researchers beside myself have learned about these magnificent animals. So I'm gonna share with you because we all like the top 10. And so here's the top 10, not necessarily in any order. This was me hurriedly put these top 10 together for you for tonight. So the first thing is that loons, of course, number 10, do not mate for life. And after doing this for decades now, we see the average pair might stay together for six or seven years. Uh, one pair stayed together for 17 years. But for the most part, if humans have a seven-year itch, we might say humans, uh, loons might have a seven-year itch. So a loon might have two or three partners, reproductive partners during its lifetime. And we were only able to discover that is because we had banded birds back in the early 1990s over their lifetime. So that's number one, number 10. Number nine, we now have loons that are over 30 years old that are still living and still reproducing. So that is pretty impressive. Like when we started out, we didn't think loons that we caught at Sydney National Wildlife Refuge where you saw that picture of me with the big beard releasing a loon. There's two loons in that water body that are still living that we, we caught in 1989 and 1992. And the bird we caught in 1989 was actually an adult bird. So it takes a while to get a territory. So some really fascinating aspects. So I'm not sure all loons live to be 30 years old. I, I think there's a fair amount of mortality that takes place between 20 and 30 years of age. But we do know several that have lived beyond 30 and we're gonna keep tracking them and figure out how long these birds can live. As you know, some birds like albatrosses, parrots can live 50 to 60 years. Uh, even great horned owls are long lived, for example. All right, number eight. Kevin Keenow, a researcher in Michigan, was able to recover some depth sensors that he put on loons. And what he found was that the loons were swimming in Lake Michigan during migration literally 150 to 180 feet all the way down to the bottom and then surfacing, pausing for a little bit and literally going 150 to 180 feet per dive. So it wasn't spending any time trying to find fish in the middle depths of the water or at the surface. It was feeding on bottom feeders 
predominantly round goby, which was an introduced fish, uh, but having be, seemed to be very successful. So that was kind of fascinating to see some interesting foraging behavior in loons that previously to this, without that technology, we wouldn't have been able to discover that. So our next one is that loons exhibit winter site fidelity. So I was involved in a research project in Maine where we put satellite transmitters and loons up in Northern Maine and we track them. And what you're looking at is the gray is where the loon lived and spent the winter one year. And the light gray is where the loon spent the second winter. And you can see that those areas overlap on both left and right uh, pictures. So the one on the left is Chincoteague Bay in Maryland, and the other one is Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And what this suggests to me, and we've seen this now with other birds, not just these two, but loons exhibit winter site fidelity. So they go back to the same area of the beach, of the lake, uh, for example, you know, year after year. And there's a loon that we caught in Morro Bay, California, that has been going back there for 16 consecutive years. Uh, there's a loon in Biddeford Pool, I know that's like six or seven years old in terms of returning. And that's kind of what we found. I've caught loons in South Carolina that have returned for five consecutive winters. That loons, once they get familiar with the place, are gonna return there. And you can ask yourself, like the advantage of that is you get to be familiar with it. So if you're thinking of where am I gonna go for a summer vacation or winter vacation, you might go to a place where you've been before because you're familiar with it. You're gonna be much more efficient. And for a loon, you're gonna know where the food is, what the threats are, what possibilities even exist, for example. So it's not that surprising to see that these birds exhibit winter site fidelity. Okay, number six, behavioral flexibility in winter. So after spending, you know, last 11 years looking at loons in the ocean. You know, what I see is oftentimes loons can be solitary as we see in the bottom right, for example. And it's not uncommon for them to be highly social and in fairly large flocks of 50 or 100 or even more. This particular flock we estimated to be over 600 birds. That's pretty impressive. This was about seven to eight miles off the, off the coast of Mississippi. So birds that are flock foraging are feeding on, on school, schooling fish. And they're gonna have much higher probability and success foraging as a group than they were as an individual. And that's what we find through, periodically. So these groups are very mobile, uh, they'll, they'll move, and they're very uh, loose, for example, that they'll form uh, for maybe two or three hours and then they'll break down. And what I have noticed is that loons, if they come across schooling fish, will hoot almost with literally the intention to bring other individuals nearby. And I've certainly seen them respond to that. So that was one of the fascinating aspects of spending time on boats in the ocean in the winter is making these kinds of discoveries. All right, number five. So loons can recognize their neighbor's yodels. And although most of us be, might be familiar with the yodel, I'm gonna play you a yodel. And I want you to kind of look at this sonogram. And what we're looking at is there's, you'll see in both of these, there's like a little introductory phase followed by a series of bumps going up and down like valleys and peaks, repetitive. And so, the introductory part of the loon is almost like if I'm trying to get someone's attention, I'm gonna say, hey, you. And then I get that person's attention and then I deliver my message. So the introductory note of the yodel is more of like just to alert other birds in the area, I'm calling out, pay attention, and then I'm gonna deliver my message. So now here's the yodel, listen to the introductory part and then kind of the repeat phrase. So this is the repeat, introductory phase, and then the repeat phase. 
All right, so that's not the call of the loon, of course, but it's, it, is, it is a call of the loon, the yodel. And yodels are just given by males, highly aggressive, territorial, announcing I am here. So now kind of going back to these neighbor stranger studies, Jay Mager and Charlie Walcott and uh, even Walter Piper, I believe was involved in this research where you can actually almost like get all the vocal recordings of all the loons on a lake in an area. And what you find is that there's subtle differences, but they all recognize each other's. And if you remove one loon from the equation and substitute by putting in another loon, they recognize that as a stranger. And what a loon will do is it'll have many more repeats. It'll change its tune in response to that stranger. So they're responding to that stranger and those extra peaks and valleys that you see there is kind of expressing its intent, its motivation to defend itself and to alert this new stranger that I'm the top dog on the water body. And I have a whole chapter on some of the neat, fascinating aspects of acoustics that researchers have learned about loons. Now, this one is, is one of those that you may not have heard about, but we have had a couple of loons have died from malaria and West Nile virus. Uh, not at all to any epidemic proportions, but it's just something that we should be alerted to, of course, and I felt I should kind of share that with you as well. Now, this one here, the number three thing aspect of this one is I show you a bottle in the cork, but loons have low genetic diversity. So we just published on this a year ago. So sampling the gene pool from loons all across North America, we see loons are fairly similar in terms of their genetic diversity. Now, as humans have very low genetic diversity, for example. And for loons, it was just, it was fortunately, it came of time that we wanted to just learn how much diversity is in this population. The reason low genetic diversity might be a concern is about the ability to adapt to some other threats that they, have, they haven't been exposed to. And so having a gene, very diverse gene pool, you're more likely to adapt to changing climatic environmental conditions, uh, environmental threats, for example. So I talk about that in the book as well. And how did loons probably get to that? Just real briefly, I'll just give some background. Remember glaciers have waxed and waned for the last, you know, literally 5 million years. And we've had like 20 major glacial episodes. So when a glacier is advancing across North America, where's the loon gonna, where's it gonna breed, right? It's gonna get pushed south, Georgia, South Carolina, trying to find a lake, a water body in which to breed. Then the glaciers recede, and of course the loons then expand their range north. And this waxing and waning took place multiple times. And I think there, there came a pinch point in the population where there were probably just a few, few individuals. And so all loons are probably descendant of those loons that survived those repeated kind of uh, glacial events. So I talk about that in the book. Number two, this is the dark side of the loon. And if you're not familiar with this, um, some, some, some surprising results that loons are highly aggressive. You know, we use the word uber aggressive. And so during the breeding season, when they establish a territory, both males and, and females, it seems, right, will attack members of their own sex and kind of chase them out from the territory, oftentimes very aggressively. But now picture yourself, you're a young loon, six years old, uh, hormones are surging. You need to establish yourself on a lake as well. Your genes aren't gonna get passed down if you're never going to challenge a resident bird. Uh, unless the territory opens up. So you might then patrol the lake, see if a territory opens up. And it might, in one case, if an adult doesn't come back from the winter, let's say there's a mortality event or during migration, it, it falls uh, to some unfortunate incident. So there might be an open territory. So that's why loons are kind of circling and moving around on a larger lake. But at some point you might challenge a resident bird. The resident bird has more at stake and especially an older bird has more at stake. And what Walter Piper found is that some of these older birds might actually fight to the death because they may not get a chance to breed, for example, if they move for like a second or third time. So Mark Pokris, who's done tons of necropsies, an emeritus professor at Tufts University, Mark looked at the sternum and the breastplate of loons, thousands of them, 
And what he noticed were that these, these little holes in there. And Mark surmised and took a loon bill, put it inside it, and sure enough, it fit. And he found that half the loons that died had sternal punctures. Roughly the average number was about seven. And both males and females had them with equal frequency uh, and numeric abundance. So that suggests to me, females can be fairly aggressive as well, not just males as we're kind of sometimes we're programmed to think. So this was something that was really fascinating. And the last one that you may not be aware of is that translocation efforts of loons have taken place in the last decade. I worked on this project in Minnesota where we moved loons from Northern Minnesota to Southern Minnesota, distance of 285 miles. And literally what we tried to do is move chicks all in the hope of just to see, is it possible as a conservation tool to translocate loons? And so we started this in 2014 in Minnesota. Uh, I investigated 307 lakes in Minnesota to identify loons lakes that would be suitable for such translocation efforts. Uh, this is a place called Fish Lake in Southern Minnesota. We ended up putting up these pens in these enclosures where we raised uh, and fed the chicks. And this is me releasing the very first loon chick that's ever was tried in 4.35 in the morning, August 14th, August 15th, 2014. And it was a thrill to be involved clearly in this project. And now some of you may be aware there's translocation efforts taking place now in Massachusetts and some chicks in Maine are being moved to Massachusetts. And what you may not be aware of in 2020, the first successful breeding of a translocated individual in Massachusetts. So this showed us that it can work, that you can move chicks. They will go back to the lake where they were, no, not hatched from, but where they were, were released from and stay in that area and eventually find a partner and mate. So that's kind of real exciting news. So I have so many people to thank and I don't have enough time to do that. From Darwin Long and Hannah Yorkook, Brooks Wade, Jay Mager, Dave Evers, Lucy Vitzel-Vlietstra, Mike Chickering in part, 52 biologists I've had a chance to work with for multiple days in the field. Uh, I've learned tons from them. They were great, great comrades, great friends. Uh, felt very blessed to spend time with them. I have also want to thank, I've kind of had 248 volunteers work with me in the field over this time. And these are volunteers who've worked for at least a week. So this number, if I counted volunteers who helped me for a day or two, would easily get over 500. Most of my funding came from Earthwatch Institute, which is a group in Boston. I'm extremely appreciative of them and Biodiversity Research Institute as well helped out. And of course, this story that I tell in the book wouldn't have been possible as well without some of the great research that other loon researchers across North America are doing. Okay, so that's it. Thank you for tuning in to the loon. Uh, it's inspiration, of course. And the photo credits for Dan Paulus, Chuck, Ginger Gum, and Darwin Long took most of these, if not all these photographs. And I certainly want to thank them. So thank you for your time. And we can have a few minutes now for Q&A and um, I think we can just have you bring things in for us, uh, Susan, and we can go from there. Hi, yes, thanks so much, Jim. That was a great, so much great information. Uh, we do have people, uh, co questions coming in. If anyone has a question and wants to put it in the chat, that would be great. I'll just sort of start plugging away. I, I think the questions are, are going to, oh boy, the questions are going to out, outnumber, we're not going to have enough time for all the questions to be answered, but um, we'll do our best um, to get through as many as we can in the next, let's see, we have about, well, we probably have 15 minutes if we go a little bit over, and I assume that's okay with you, Jim. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll start with a, Patricia, a question from Patricia Lawson. Um, how do loons adapt how do they make that at how what do they need to do to adapt from fresh water to salt water yeah thank you patricia so what we feel happens is when you move to a marine environment it's extraordinarily salty and some of the fish and prey items they feed on such as crabs for example are very salty as well and so for a bird they have to kind of find a way to excrete that excess salt 
And we know other marine birds, for example, make a living, have a salt gland, a nasal gland, where they excrete salt. And so a loon has a salt gland as well that sits above the eye. And it basically becomes activated when it reaches a marine environment. And I think that's a carryover from the loon ancestor. So in other words, they didn't have to evolve a salt gland. I think they had a salt gland. When they moved into fresh water, it became deactivated. And yet when they move back into the winter environments, that salt gland becomes activated. And basically it squirts out concentrated salt solution. So it helps the kidney and everything to eliminate salt relatively quickly. Because as you're aware, too much salt in the system can dry you out. So thank you. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Roy Lambert asked about aggressive behavior. Um, and if it asked, ask, pardon me, does the loon aggressive behavior change throughout the summer, fall season? That is after the breeding season. Yeah, so. I know this answer, but. Yeah, sure, certainly. And we think Aggressive behavior oftentimes is linked to hormones such as testosterone. And you can see why they might be adaptive, for example, to be highly territorial and aggressive. And I think even more so if the number of lakes are limiting. So if there's a surplus of lakes, if every loon could get a lake, there wouldn't be necessarily the need for territoriality. So that tells us because there's just an exit numbers of lakes out there, loons that are trying to find themselves and gain access to that. So they become very territorial. And when they have young, they wanna be territorial and uh, kind of making sure there's enough food to feed the family. But once the chicks now reach a certain age, territoriality tends to break down at loons, especially kind of come late August and September. And many of the folks here are on lakes. See loons start to engage in these little social gatherings, very ritualized behaviors. And at that point, their hormones are, are kind of waning. and and especially in the winter time, I rarely see any aggressive territoriality behavior in loon. So over the course of the breeding season, I think it's, it's just heightened. So it's almost like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, right? Don't mess with me like late April, May, June, maybe through mid July. And then afterwards, hey, it's all good, come together. Let's go to California, go to the beach. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry about that, it's a little, little impromptu, but that's- Yeah, that's good. Okay. That's good. That's, that's well, so that was my understanding as well. So um, thanks for clarifying that. Um, this is just an important question because I think uh, this, I think will be quick from Dan Boward. Is there concern around increased drag produced by the, by the leg, the bands that you put on the leg bands or, you know, really any effect? Um, that right, you, yeah. That, yeah. No, that's a wonderful question. Absolutely. Have we tested it? No, we haven't. And indirectly, and, and that is, and I've thought about that, all of us have thought about this actually a lot. The fact that we go out the very next day and see loons and have seen loons year after year after year that are now 30 years old that have these bands, I can't imagine at that point that it's been any, it's caused unnecessary hardship for them because they've been around for 20, 30 years with these bands. But it certainly makes one wonder, and I'm glad you asked that question, and I certainly have wondered as well. I think at some point it's got to create some drag, but I think it must be minimal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think if there was any documentation that it was a problem, you wouldn't be allowed to do it. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, there is that oversight from the federal government when they're issuing those per band permits. And everybody who has, who, can, who has to put on, who is allowed to put on bands has a, has a, you know, there's a pretty strong permitting process behind that too. So, right. so a couple questions about um, feeding um, and I'll, I'll ask two questions together. Um, how many, how much fish in pounds does a common loon eat in a season in Maine? Um, and then also sort of what's their success in, in catching fish? Like, of, you know, if they, if they make a hundred dives, is there any information out there about how successful they are at catching fish? Yeah, I think it's, you got a couple of different things going on in terms of success. I think when they're feeding for their chicks, they're probably more successful because they're going after smaller prey items that I think are a little easier because of their body size to overcome and catch. So then the success rate when they're feeding chicks, I think is very high. Uh, as they get older, it might be a little more challenging. Uh, there's been a few people that kind of saw loons diving adults underwater 
uh, for the most part, fairly successful, but I think that's gonna depend on the lake, levels of turbidity, prey species. So some species might be able to uh, actually, like a trout might be able to swim quickly and outrun, for example, a loon for short burst of speed, uh, where a perch might zig and zag to try to evade capture, they might be more vulnerable. So in terms of their weight, you know, they're, they're warm blooded, we use that term broadly, right? And so in other words, they have a fairly high metabolic rate. So the body temperature of a loon is probably 103 or 104 degrees is normal body temperature. And when you have anything that increases its body temperature in organism, you're gonna kind of increase metabolic rate. So things are kind of turning over quickly. So for a loon, it has fairly high metabolism which means it might need to eat about a third of its weight in a day, right? So if it's a 10 pound loon, you might need to eat three pounds of fish or something like that. So it might actually be, you know, several hundred pounds that will be taken, you know, 500 to maybe even more pounds, right? From a family that's working on a corner of a lake. But mm -hmm. mind you, you have to also keep in mind just how much productivity fish are being produced. So, if the loons were taking such a significant portion of the fish, then the population over time, right, would dwindle and wouldn't be able to support them. So it seems that loons are taking excess that keeps them within the carrying capacity of the fish, for example. Right, right. Well, and I always talk, when I'm talking about loons with folks, I always mention that, you know, that nobody really has, that you can't keep loons in, a, in captivity, um, and so it's really hard to do those feeding studies because they, they don't survive in captivity. They don't like it. They get too stressed out. They don't survive. And so it's not like there's a lot, you know, that, that gathering that data is really hard to do. Yeah, and it just shows you that's a good example, Susan, of kind of the difficulty of trying to do uh, observe, just solely observational study on a species without being able to bring it into a laboratory to study. And yeah, yeah. With, loons, yeah with loons, that's what we're faced with, right? Right, right. Uh, somebody asked about, uh, Thomas Keegan asked about, um, and I think I know this answer for Maine. He said, you know, you showed a lot of uh, some very long seasonal migration. Are some seasonal migrations very short? Is there an average or a mean distance that loons travel? Yeah, and that's going to vary with the breeding lakes, for example. So the birds in Maine, male loons, for example, will just go strictly off the coast of Maine. So 50 to 80 to 150 miles. Uh, we put some satellite transmitters in loons and the females went down to about Cape Cod or even further south like Chincoteague Bay in Maryland. So at least the New England population, it looks like males don't migrate as far as females. And we do know they winter in different locations. So pair individuals, males and females winter in different locations. So they don't migrate together. Uh, they never see each other during the winter. They might be 500 miles apart, for example, but yet they both kind of time it to get back at the same time. So a loon that's in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, the upper Midwest, right? They might go to the Gulf of Mexico. They might go to the Atlantic side, for example. So they're gonna migrate much longer distances. So generally the pattern is that loons that are closer to the coast, both Maine birds, birds in Washington, British Columbia, uh, there's a pair in Washington that migrates just 25 miles from a breeding lake to the ocean. That might be the shortest distance, for example. Uh, and loons that are then in the interior might migrate 1,000 or 1,500 miles. Yeah, so it really, it really does vary. I think people in Maine are always surprised to know that like if you, if you're on a lake in like the mid coast, your loons potentially have, you know, a 15 minute migration, right? Yeah, exa exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's worth, it's worth noting, Susan, real briefly too, is that because they have such high body mass, for example, right? Such high body mass, I think we're still good, right? Something happened with the screen. Are we still good? Yeah, let me see. I don't know who this person is, but um, trying to turn off. Let's see, Michael Frost, if you could stop sharing and I will try to figure out how to regain control. There we go. All right. Sure. Okay, go ahead, Jim. 
Well, um, we're, we're, I lost track thought of my thought for a second there. What were I did too. So we were talking about migrate, short migrations off the coast of Maine. It will, did we move on to another question though? I thought. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to another sure, question. Sounds good. sounds good. Thank you. There's a lot of them. Hold on. Now I got to get my chat back. Uh, let's see. Chat. Um, hold on. There's a bunch of questions. So we're not, we're not done with questions yet. Um, all right. But now I've lost. Okay, here we go. Okay. So uh, let's see. This was a good one. I think lots of people are curious about this is the foot waggle. You know, when they, you know, when they're sitting in the water and they stick their foot, foot out and give it the shake. What's that all about? Why are they doing that? Yeah, that's uh, one of, it's certainly one of the fascinating things about loons. And I thought it was just unique to loons. But if you watch mergansers, if you watch Goldeneye and Scop, you'll see other sea ducks will foot waggle as well. So that's fascinating, right? Because we, we see it so prevalent with loons because we're out there watching them 24 seven. And these other birds are more nesting in more reclusive areas. I don't know if they do it with the same frequency with loons, but they certainly perform it as well. And there was an expert at the University of Minnesota who specialized in kind of foot waggles and what was going on. And I certainly had an interest in that for several years, trying to unravel what was happening with the foot waggle. One of the things this professor felt was that because loons oftentimes would get to the bottom of the lake and they're rooting around, right, looking for fish, for example, that they might get some mud or debris or sticks, which I've seen because I have handled loons in the webbing when they close their foot. And so when they go and ship their foot, so he's shipping it is the term terminology when they put it on their back, for example. If you have any dirt or debris, that might disrupt, for example, the smoothness of the feathers. And a loon stays waterproof by having those feathers really tight and zipped. Anything that's dirt, debris there might upset that, for example. So the thinking, right, is that it's shaking and removing every dirt and debris that's conceivably possible. Uh, people have said, and I've, I would agree, it's not often you see any, anything actually coming off from it. But I do think that's in part one of the explanations behind it. Um, another one, I, I don't know if I completely buy into this as well, but the loon when it's swimming is just mostly just using kind of one motion. And the idea is that at some point you might need to kind of relax your foot and go in the opposite direction. And so I've heard this as well. And yeah, it's, it's kind of of interest as well. So all at the end of the day, I think we're kind of mostly thinking that before it ships its foot, it kind of wants its foot clear of any debris. That's what I'm going with, Susan. Okay, that makes sense to me. Okay. Uh, we'll do one more quick question. We're starting to lose folks and we've been over an hour. So I'll just ask this last question and then um you know we'll have we'll save the chat if if um if there's a few other there's a lot of great questions actually um uh somebody a quick question i think i can even answer that is distinguishing the sex when they're swimming is that the larger one is going to be the male if you can That's distinguish correct. guys is that yeah i, I think and it, it literally is like 25 to almost 30 percent larger now, it's with, so it's noticeable, but what I was going to suggest that what we want to be careful about is loons have air sacs and they can compress those air sacs with feathers and make themselves look smaller or larger, right? Their specific gravity can change in the water. So if both birds are relaxed and comfortable, then it's easy to tell a male from female. Oh, right, right. But if they squeeze and lower the, you can't get fooled. So one thing that I'll mention that works for me is the thickness of the neck between the two, the male is larger. It's also the same thing in the Canada goose, so you can look for a thicker neck. And the head almost looks shorter. So the bill on an adult male, even though it's larger than the female, it looks shorter compared to the larger head. And the female looks like it has a longer bill proportionally to its head. So check those out and see if that helps you separate okay. males from females. Okay. And that wasn't actually the last question I was going to ask. So, but thank you. That's really helpful. Um, 
The last question is just about uh, is about a red throated about red throated loons, and um, you know they show up in Maine occasionally. And somebody from uh, let's see, Rich Woodbury from Great Moose Lake just wondered he ha they had a red throated loon on their lake um, for a few days in July. And, you know, especially given if hopefully people have heard the news about the stellar sea eagle in, in New Brunswick, which is an Asian species that's kind of made its way across um, Canada over the course of the summer. So birds, you know, it's increasingly, it feels like increasingly noticeable that these migrant, these vagrants show up in odd places. So um, as a last note, do you have any, he, so Rich specifically asked, could this have been a migrant that was just taking his time? getting to Western May, Western Canada, or, you know, do you know, do you have any insight into sort of red throated yeah, loons yeah. in Maine? Sure, I do. And, and first of all, how cool to look at red throated loons, right? And if I, I have in my book, I have in my book, if I was to do it all over again, not quite, but if I could study another bird, it'd be red throated loons. Um, I talk about that in the book. They're really fascinating and I'm certainly intrigued by them. But most of the birds that we do see in Maine in May, little less so in July, and I have an explanation, is they're moving through Quebec and they breed kind of north, north of St. Lawrence and then across, across Canada. So we see loons on some of those lakes in Maine in April and May when those red throated are moving through. A bird in July is probably a younger loon, absolutely. And loons take several years to reach kind of their full plumage. They're not gonna be able to gain access to a territory. So that's more likely like a two or three year old bird that's not in a hurry to get to the breeding grounds because there's not one available for it. And I've seen some younger birds in July, for example, even common loons that are hanging off the, the coast here because there's no place to go to get back to the breeding grounds. So I would think that's probably a two or three year old red throated loon that you saw in July. Great observation. Uh, and they're just great birds to observe anytime. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jim, so much. There's still more good questions, but I think uh, we're losing people and it's 737. So we'll end there. Um, just a reminder, people can find his book. It is on Amazon and the big sellers, but of course, uh, you know, we are, are encourage you to go to your independent booksellers or to the publisher, which is the Minnesota um, University of Minnesota Press. Uh, and I think that email was in our slideshow, but if you Google you know, University of Minnesota Press, you'll find it. So um, that's where to find Jim's book. Uh, thank you all for um, your interest. There's a lot of great stuff going on with loons in Maine. And uh, like I said, we're lucky to have Jim here. And um, in fact, and I think this was in the slideshow as well, we're doing a loon restoration project in Maine. Um, there was a, an oil spill many years ago in uh, Buzzards Bay, and there's some recovery money coming to Maine. And so there's a lot of different projects going on in the next uh, five years that have to do with loon rafts, and which you didn't even touch on, but loon rafts and um, lots of exciting stuff going on with loons in Maine. So for anybody out there, keep in touch with us at Maine Lakes. Uh, buy Jim's book and read more about loons. And um, we do have a webinar series. Our uh, Maine Lakes Conference has unfortunately the in-person portion, which we'd hope to have in June has been canceled. So we are doing a series of webinars and we will definitely be talking. We will definitely have ones about one about loons and loon recovery in Maine. So, um, so with that, thank you so much, Jim, for being here tonight and sharing all this great information. And um, I look forward to reading your book. Thank you, Susan. And thanks, everybody. Appreciate the kind words. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>